Well, praise the Lord. Good evening. Welcome to Joy and Praise Fellowship. It's so good to have each and every one of you tonight in God's house. And it's just, it's just been a beautiful day. And it's going to continue to get better and better tonight. We're going to have a great service tonight. We're going we're gonna to praise him until we worship. We're going to worship until the presence of God is felt in this place. And we're going to hear a word that's going to change our lives, hopefully, and all that kind of great stuff. But I'd like us to pray for a few things before we get started tonight. Um, but we, um, we went and saw Tom McCullen today. Um, where's Darlene? She's here. There she is, right? Darlene's here. It's good to see Darlene. Tom's making progress. Um, he still needs our prayers, so we've got to keep praying for him and keep believing that God will heal him even faster yet. But he's, it's a process. He's been through so much, the poor guy. But he's a fighter, you know, and, and I know he's getting better because he was a little sassy today. So I know that's Tom. He's getting a little better. So. But let's keep praying for Tom. Let's keep praying for Rob. You know, um, Sandy was telling that Rob's having a little flutter with that heart of his, so they're going to see a doctor tomorrow and tomorrow, right? So let's just see, maybe, maybe do an ablation, maybe not. Let's see what the doctor says. But, you know, God's the ultimate doctor, so God will make the decision what, what to do there. So keep, let's, let's keep Rob in our, in our prayers. Ron Morgan, Ron Morgan's not doing well, well. Let's keep him in our prayers. And Rebecca here is going to get all four of her wisdom teeth taken out Friday morning. All four. So she's not real excited about that. Very reassuring. And then she didn't get, and then, of course, then she got really upset with me when I said, well, um, you're going to lose all your wisdom on Friday. So, I mean, you know, you're not going to be very smart come, come next week. So, um, anyway, so, let, so let's keep her in our prayers. Linda, the nicest surgeon tomorrow, too. So, you know, we got, we got some things to pray about, right? So why don't we stand in God's house? We'll address these right now. And then we'll pray about the service tonight as well, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, God, that we have a God who's alive. A God who's alive. We're not praying to a dead God. We're praying to a living God. And, and, a, and a living God that can heal still today and deliver and set people free. God, we pray today in Jesus' name that you would uh, reach down from heaven because of your grace and mercy. And that you would touch Tom McCullen right where he is. God, when we talked to him this, earlier today, the, I asked him, what do you want to do? He said, I, I want to go to church. So, the, so he's got his heart in the right place, God. So, you know, honor his wishes, God. Get him well quicker than the doctors even think, God. And take away any blood that's still on his, on his brain and strengthen that spinal cord and that body, God. And help him, God, to, as they're moving into rehab, help him to just, just to recover real quick, God. And, and, to, and to see him even sooner than we think, God. In Jesus. Pray for Rob Thompson that, that whatever causes his heart to flutter, God, that it will be taken care of easily, God, and efficiently. Maybe you can even take care of it tonight, God, if you want. Save the doctors a, a procedure in Jesus' name. We pray for Ron Morgan that you will reach down into that body of his God and restore to Ron, God, all that the enemy is trying to steal from him. And touch the whole Morgan family as well tonight that they're under an attack in the name of Jesus. We pray for Rebecca, God, that you will give her great favor with the dentist and the oral surgeon. When they take out her wisdom teeth, God, help her to have a fast recovery, God. Help her not to say too many crazy things under anesthesia, God, and, and just be with her, God, and help her mom and her husband to take care of her and the baby as well. In Jesus' name, we pray for Linda Nice, that you would give her favor in her procedure tomorrow as well, that all things will be well and no need for any concern or worry, God, and, and just take care of her and heal her, God, in the name of Jesus. And for this night, God. We pray for this service, for all of, all of our needs, spoken and unspoken in this house tonight, that you would just help us and bless us and encourage us tonight. And, and may this service, God, that we become edified by, may it bring you glory in heaven today. And we give you all the praise for this in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Welcome to the house of the Lord tonight. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? It is, good, it is good to be in the house of the Lord where he can worship and you can praise him. But let me, let me just give you a little, little something for, for thought. A couple weeks ago when um, my husband preached that message of, um, I don't know what it was. It was um, something to do with the, the, the last, the tribulation or something like that. I don't recall. And the seven seals, yes. Um, and um, we had prayed, I had prayed a prayer to God. I said, Lord, you know, we all sin. We all fall, fall short of the glory of God every single day. But, Lord, if there's anything within me that it's not of you, I want you to show it to me. I want you to let me know because I want to be purged of everything. Well, this past week, I've had the week, I felt like I was dancing with the devil the whole week. 
because that's how bad it got. It got so rough. And it got to the point where I was asking God, I was questioning my God, where are you? Where are you in the midst of this? And I was crying before the Lord. And my poor husband was getting the brunt of it. He was showing me that there was anger in me. Not from the things that were going on, but from the past of the things that, were ha that had happened to me inside of me. From my very beginning, from everything. He goes, there's still anger in you. And I need it out. So let me tell you something, folks. You may come to church. You may praise the Lord. But if you haven't asked the Lord, Lord, search within me what is going on within me to take out everything that is not of you, let me tell you that my God cannot work on a dirty cup. Everything needs to come out. Everything needs to be purged. Everything needs to be rebuked in the name of Jesus. And I'm just letting you know, it is time for God to move in this church. Yes. It is time for the Holy Spirit to move like he's never done before. Because people are going to be coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And we have to be prepared. So start asking God, Lord, show me what I have to get rid of. Amen. Amen. And you know what? You don't need an invitation to come up here in this front. You can get prayed for any time. All you have to do is step out in faith. Don't hold on to the back of that chair. You know what? Let the Holy Spirit move in here. Don't shove him out the door, okay? Because you can't get healed from anything when you're shoving him out the door. Amen? Amen? So let that fire fall. Don't be afraid of it. If you're feeling uneasy, that's you getting healed. Amen? Amen? Let's praise him tonight. Amen. forever rain.
you're a good, good father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dead of night. 
You are worthy, worthy, worthy are you, Lord. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Jesus, just lift up your hands to me. Just worship the Lamb who was slain.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. We give you praise tonight in this house, God. We join with the angels around your throne now in heaven, God, and we praise you, God. For holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And to the Lamb who was slain, we give you praise today, God. You're worthy, God, in this house tonight. You are worthy, God. We can't see the angels because of the veil, God, but the angels are encompassing this place tonight. The angels are here with us worshiping you, God, because you are worthy of it, God. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end, and we give you praise tonight, God. You're the one true and living God. There is no God beside you, and we praise you and we honor you, God. And we look forward to that day where we can come around that throne, God, or come around that heavenly throne and worship you, God, face to face. Thank you, God, for your people tonight. Thank you for our praise and our worship unto you tonight, God. I pray God has come from our hearts as much as it come from our lips tonight. And I pray you be with us tonight and bless us, God, and help us tonight. We pray all this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you greet somebody out there? Extend a hand of fellowship to somebody near you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for worshiping God with us. Thank you for being here. Those that are at home, thank you for watching the stream. We hope that you're feeling as blessed as we're feeling here tonight. Do we have any first-time guests with us? First time you've ever stepped a foot in this building, raise your hand. Right over here, this sister right over here, this sister right over here as well, Luke. Back over here too. Right over here. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to have you. As we, as we always say, if you, if you don't have a church home and you're, and you're interested in one, we would love for you to consider being part of our church family. You know, we, we, um, we're a great church here. You know, we, we don't, you know, we worship God. We praise God. We have great ministries. Um, we only play with snakes on Tuesday nights and drink poison on Thursdays. But, I mean, it's, it's just, um, it's, it's, other than that, we're okay, man. So come on out and be a part of this church, and, uh, and I know you'll have a great time. But it is good to, to be with us tonight, each and every one of you, and it's just so awesome to be here. And it's a good, it's a pretty decent Wednesday night attendance tonight for being summer months. I, I thank God for that. I thank God for that. But at this time, we're going to go ahead and extend our, our worship unto the Lord by, by, you know, receiving an offering tonight unto the Lord. So those that are going to be helping us, can you please come and, and prepare yourself to receive the offering unto the Lord tonight? All right. Father God, tonight in the name of Jesus, we ask God that you would honor this offering tonight, God, that you would anoint it and bless it, God, and help this offering to um, just further your kingdom, God, and may be used to, to advance lives for, the, for Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We met half a dozen times. I know your name. I know you don't know mine. But I won't hold that against you. You come here every Friday night I take your order and try to be polite And hide what I've been going through with you Looked me right in the eye Would you see the pain deep inside? Would you take the time? Tell me what I need to hear Praise the Lord. Amen. By um, way of a few announcements, we have out on the counter um, these flyers here. Just something to think about, look at. You know, it, this, there, there's an in, individual that's um, teaching Emmett Anderson, Emmett, Emmett Anderson Healing Ministries, being Crystal River. Um, got an address on here. And they're teaching all about, you know, how to receive healing and, and how to dive into, the, you know, into spiritual healing. Um, you know, it's... The Bible is, is rich with, with scriptures on how we can, de you know, declare our healing in Jesus' name. And I guess this ministry here helps us to tap into that. And if you have any type of sickness or disease or some health issue that you, 
modern medicine hasn't been taken care of, you know, go over there and see what Jesus can do in this ministry right here. So um, it empowers you to trust God through the scriptures, and um, it's something that you might want to think about. It's over there. It's got some out there on the, on the counter if you want to take a look at that. Also, we are flocking. As some of you know, the, the youth group is putting flamingos in your yards as a fundraiser. So we encourage you to, um, if, there is a flaming, if there is some plastic flamingos in your yard, don't throw them away. Don't shoot them with a pellet gun, okay? Call Scott and give him some money. He'll remove them, okay? But um, that's what it's all about. So be mindful of that. Also, um, August 30th, Tuesday, August 30th, 10 o'clock in the morning, Sandy Thompson's Tuesday morning Bible study and revelation is kicking up again in next year. So that'll be um, two weeks, two weeks. So um, it's coming up real soon. So those that signed up, make sure you're there for that on time. Next Wednesday, right here at this time, um, Sister Bernice will be starting a four-week series on Beyond Blessed. Uh, it's a series taught by Robert Morris that she'll be teaching. It's got a little bit of video in it and a little bit of, you know, um, audible teaching in it. So it's going to be a great um, study on, you know, on, on um, how to gain financial freedom and, um, and how, to, how to use that freedom to bless God's kingdom. How many of you say, you know what, I don't want to come to that. I have too much money. I don't need any more money. You know, anybody? No? Okay, so we can all be here for that. Um, this Saturday, right here in the same church, um, August 20th at 6 o'clock, starting at 6, we're going to be having some light refreshment for those of you in Joy Club, which is our 50 years of age and older ministry. We're going to have some light refreshments at 6, and with the movie at 6.30 the fall. We have a movie night for you um, seniors this coming Saturday. Also, for those on the board, we have a board meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Try to be there for that on time if you can. We have the food and fellowship group sign-up sheets out there on the foyer counter or on the table in front of the foyer counter. We already have sign-up leaders. We just need people now to sign up for these groups. These groups are so important because they're all about developing relationships, okay? That's what this is all about. We have so many, you know, new people. When I say new, I don't mean like brand new today, but new over this past year that are still getting to know people. What better way to get to know somebody but than been breaking bread with them around the table, Okay. So sign up, be a part of them groups, and um, I know you will not be dissatisfied with that, okay? So that's all I have as far as the announcements tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and get into the words, so that way I won't keep you all night. But um, I um, want you to know that I've been um, really praying about this message today. I have another one I've been praying about for Sunday that, that God's going to be going to give us for Sunday. And I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, a prelude for Sunday. Anybody here ever been stuck in the mud before? Now, have you ever been also felt like you were stuck in the mud in life? Stuck in a situation. Just weren't, couldn't get out of it. Just wasn't going forward. Well, we're going to be delving with that this coming Sunday. So bring your rubber boots and let's, um, let's see what God will say on Sunday. But tonight, I, want, I wanted to, um, since next week we're going to be starting this four-week series on Beyond Bless, that, you know, this financial blessing stewardship type of four-week series, I kind of thought I'd whet your appetite tonight a little bit by sharing a little bit about stewardship tonight in a message I've, I've entitled, Avoiding the Money Pit, a look at stewardship. I really believe that, um, that God is the owner of everything. He's the, he owns the hills. He owns the, the cattle on the thousand hills as well as those hills. He owns you and I. The Bible said we were bought with a price, bought with his blood. God owns everything. But even though God owns everything, sometimes we think this stuff's ours. And when we take ownership of things that belong to him and we decide on how we're going to take care of the things that are really his because we think they're ours, sometimes we miss his will in our lives. So we're going to be diving in, into that tonight. So let's go ahead and pray and see what God would say to us tonight. So Father, as always in Jesus' name, I ask you to go before me. I ask you to unplug closed off ears and soften hard hearts and clear, clear out, clear analytical minds and help God these fine people to receive the word you gave me tonight to give to them. And I pray, God, that you hide me behind the cross and that the words they hear will not be mine, but they'll be yours tonight. And I pray all this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In um, 1986, Tom Hanks and Shelley Long, they starred in a a movie called The Money Pit. Anybody ever seen The Money called The Money Pit? It's a film really for everyone who's ever been in love, but also anyone who's ever been in debt because of your home. 
In this movie, one of my favorite lines was, was spoken by Walter Feeling. Walter Feeling, really. He the one that played by Tom Hanks. He said, I bought this house and it's killing me. The money problems that the house was producing was causing great strain on their marriage and great strain on their lives. How many of you know that money problems can cause great strain and problems in relationships? Can cause uh, marital problems, can cause even church splits, business breaks up, and it can actually cause friendships to be dissolved because of money problems. You see, the power of money can be used for, to accomplish incredibly great things, but also can produce great horrible evils as well. You see, to proper, properly harness the power of money, Paul, he offers to you and I um, so, and the believers back in his day some godly financial advice. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. Here's what he says. He says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out of it. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those of you who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows or, as another passage says, with many griefs. It says here that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, but yet godliness with great contentment is great gain. Amen. We are called by God to be content with what he gives us. Doesn't mean that we don't strive to, to, to have better and nicer things as we, as we grow and as we take care of things. The Bible says that when we're responsible for small things or little things, he gives us even greater things. So it's not that we just stay, and stay put the rest of our lives, financially speaking, but it just said that, that we, since we know that it is God's, whatever God has placed into our lives, be content with that. Be content with that. You know, I know some people out there that they think their life is meaningless because they don't have a certain amount of money or, or drive a certain car or live in a certain house. So they think their life has not achieved anything. I'm here to tell you that if you are being faithful with, with, in God and you're being faithful with what God has given you, that's all that really matters. Be content with what he's given you. You see, tonight I want to give us a little bit of perspective on how we should handle money that God gives us as good stewards. Because really what he gives us is really his in the first place, and he's asking you and I to manage what is his, okay? So tonight I want to give you a few thoughts on stewardship and a few thoughts about how to handle the resources that God gives us. And I want to begin by saying this to you. Chasing after materialism promotes discontentment. Chasing after it. Having to have it. You see, one of Paul's warnings to the Ephesian church was about false teachers. There were default teachers that were, that were coming and plaguing them because they were, they, were, they were teaching an error to the church. They were teaching that godliness is a means to financial gain. Yeah. It's, in today's term, it would be these prosperity ministers today. Yeah. You know, it, it, if, you, if, you, if you be a good guy, you be a good girl, you just serve God good, you'll be rich. The Bible said that God will take care of his own. You know, if he fed the, 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 the sparrows, he'll feed us, okay? You know, his people never go begging bread. I believe all that, okay? But nowhere in the word of God does it say just because you and I are godly that we're going to be filthy rich. It doesn't say that. He will take care of his own, and he will bless us. If, we're, if, we, if our heart's about blessing others, God will bless us. That's the way God works, okay? But just because you and I claim to be godly doesn't automatically mean that we're all going to be driving Cadillac Escalades and have our own jetliner. That's not the way it works. You see, God said that the righteous will not be shaken and, and he will provide for our needs, but that doesn't mean that we're going to guarantee all to be filthy rich, okay? We're put to be rich in Jesus, our, our treasure should be stored up in heaven. Does that mean that we're not supposed to strive for nice things? No, we're put to strive for nice things, okay, in God. But we're not supposed to think that's because we're godly that we're automatically supposed to be rich. Not rich in finances. We're supposed to be rich in the Lord, okay? Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, Paul says, I know what it is to be in need, and I also know what it is to have plenty. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Then he says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now listen, Paul here is saying, I know what it is to, 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 have, to have things, to have plenty. In, in, in our terminology, if Paul was here today, he would say, I know what it is to have a nice home. I know what it is to have a nice car, to have nice clothes, to have nice jewelry, to have a nice bank account. I know what that is. But I've also been on the other side of the railroad tracks. I know what it is to be in need. I, I've also known what it is to be in my season of need where, where you know, I, I might have lost a job and things were a little sparse. I, I you know, I had a, unfortunately, I had, a, I had a divorce. My wife took my house. I know what it is to be in a little bit of a need also, he was saying. But then he says here, it's, it's interesting, he says, but despite it all, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. In other words, he's saying, whether I have plenty or whether I have need, my strength comes from the Lord. My resources are found in him. My livelihood is wrapped up in the life I have with him. So whether I'm rich or poor, my strength still comes from him. My, in other words, he's saying that my strength doesn't come in my riches. Nor does, 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 does my failure come in my times of need. My whole identity is in Christ is what he's saying. You see, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break it and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break it and steal. He says, For where your heart or where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, now listen, now, now this doesn't mean that you can't invest. Doesn't mean you can't have a nice healthy bank account. Doesn't mean you don't have to have nice things. Listen, I hope I, my prayer is that every single one of us can, can retire and, and have a nest egg to give to our children if we have any. That's, that's great. Okay, I, I don't think God takes any pleasure in seeing poor people. You know, I don't think God walks around and says, you know what, um, if you walk around with sackcloth and ashes on and you walk around like a hermit and you walk around very humble and li live under a bridge and say Jesus is coming, that you're going to be blessed more than those that live in a gated community. That's not the way it works. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with having nice things. Strive to have nice things. But to have nice things is, is not to say, look at me. It is to say, God has blessed me with this, and I'm going to honor it. I'm going to be a good steward of what God has given me. If God gave you a tiki hut, make it, make it the best tiki hut it can be, man. If he gave you a big mansion, do the same with that. we got to be good stewards of what God has given us. Let me tell you, folks, I have been, as a pastor over the years, when I do visitations, I have been in some of the most humblest homes, financially speaking, of people in churches that didn't have a lot, and you can just sense God's presence in there. And I've been in some extravagant homes, and I didn't feel nothing there. So it doesn't always matter the size or the kind of house or whatever. It's about God. And, and if, this, if this is being given to him for the glory of God. You know, with that building back there, if, I'm going to disappoint some of y'all. If you think that building is being built just so we can have meals and have a place for the kids, you're mistaken. That is dedicated for the glory of God to try to advance the kingdom, to win souls in the process of us eating. Amen. That's what it's meant for. And that's what we got to do. That's what we got to do, you know. But he says here also in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from, love, from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So again, he talks about, about, about contentment, about keeping your life free from the love of money. Okay? It's not that money's bad. It's the love of money. Remember, don't you remember the story with the young rich ruler? The young rich ruler was rich, it says. And he talked to Jesus. And I guess he had a little bit of a conflict going on in the spirit because, you know, he might have heard some teaching that, that rich people, that, it, that it's harder to go through the eye of a needle for a camel than, than the rich man to get to heaven. So he might have he been a little scared. Let me tell you something right now. Rich people go to heaven no different than poor people go to heaven Amen. if their hearts are right. right. It's all about their heart, okay? And, and, and I'm here to tell you right now that, that in this case right here, it talks about contentment, not to love money. The rich young ruler loved his money more than he loved Jesus. So when Jesus realized that, he said, listen, it, go, go ahead and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me and you'll have riches in heaven. And the Bible said that the young rich ruler walked away sad. And I've always said this one thing I'm going to tell you right now. I've been saying it for years. It's my patent. Give me 25 cents if you use it. And that is this. That I say this, that the young rich ruler, he held on to what he could not keep. 
and he rejected the very thing he could never lose in Jesus. So it's all about your heart. People don't realize this. Lazarus was a very rich person. Jesus didn't turn him away. Abraham was a very rich person. Didn't turn him away. So it's not about, it's not, not that God has a problem with rich people. He has, he has a problem with rich people whose heart is loves their money more than they love God. So chasing after materialism promotes discontentment. You're never, you're never happy. You know, you, do you know what people, what rich people who don't, who don't have their heart in the right place, you know what they want more than anything in the world? More money. People with more power want more power. People with more money want more money if their heart's not right. But if your heart is right, if your heart is right, you're saying, God, this is not my money. It's your money. Apparently, you trust me. I'm a good manager of your money. You know I use it not only for, for my life to be blessed, but to bless others, and God will keep doing it. He'll keep doing it. He'll keep doing it. Amen. I know the people in this church that are doing quite well, they're some of the best givers there is. The people in our church I see that are doing quite well financially, I also notice they're very good givers. I don't mean just giving financially, giving in their life, giving of themselves. And God sees that. God sees that, and that's why they continue to be blessed financially as well as tangibly. So we cannot be chasing after materialism, pro, ter, materialism if we expect to, um, to be you know, in contentment with the Lord. But another thing I want to give you here tonight to think about is leaving, leaving God out of our financial decisions leads to wrong choices. What am I saying? In my own personal life, I take an inventory of myself. I look back over my life, and I can tell you pretty, pretty accurately here that some 99, 98% of the bad choices I made, I made because I didn't involve God in it. In other words, I didn't seek God out for the answer first. I didn't pray to him, say, God, should I buy this car? Should I buy this house? Should I do this? Should I do that? I didn't seek God out first. You see, many people make decisions first and pray later. When they should be praying first and making the decision later. You see, when we acknowledge God's ownership, when we all acknowledge God's ownership, means that God owns it all. He owns our house. He owns our cars, our lives, our children, our bank accounts, our jobs, our ministries. When we realize that God owns it all, listen to this, every spending decision becomes a spiritual decision. When it's God's, it becomes a spiritual decision because it's not ours. Is his. So we pray. When our kids go off to college, God, do you want our kids to go to this college or that college? Lead us, lead them to where you want them to be. If they're in God's perfect will, they're going to have success. If they're not, they won't. The same thing with everything we do. I tell you, if you really look back over your life, I know my wife and I have, and we look at the, the, the decisions that have been prosperous, those were the ones that we sought God on, and the ones that have not been prosperous, we didn't seek God on. We sought ourselves on. Every spending decision becomes a spiritual decision once we give him ownership of everything. It's so funny to me. I do baby dedications a lot of time, and they, they dedicate their children to the Lord, and then the first sign of trouble, they take the kid back. My wife and I learned that. We're the first time in our existence, all of you have, have learned this a long time ago, but we just learned it. We were, nest, we were empty nesters for the first time. Mary, she's kind of there, but she still got Sophia. But we were finally gone. My son was gone, my older daughter gone, and Emily was gone. She just came back the other day, but they were gone. And, man, the first term that she was gone, man, we didn't know what, how to act, man. <laughs> I don't mean like just, you know, missing. No, we were worried. Is she going to be Okay. Is she going to be okay? Is she going to be, you know, always worried. She got a little sniffles. Oh, boy, do we got to fly to Pennsylvania for sniffles? You know, all that kind of stuff. I had to be reminded by the Lord, she belongs to him. He loves her more than we will ever love her or my son or my other's oldest daughter. God loves them. And if God has called your children, my children, you or I to someplace, God will take care. He will provide. He will provide. That's why when she went back this last time, yeah, we, do, we, we missed her, but when she came back, we said, you back already? You know, it's a little different, it's a little different story to time around. <clears throat> As stewards, we must know that everything belongs to him. I say this over and over. I'm going to keep saying it over and over because I don't think we say amen, but I don't think we quite realize it. It all belongs to the Lord. People, oh, I, no, I don't. I bought it. It's, no, listen, don't you remember growing up with your siblings? 
If you had a, if you had a, like me and my sister, we didn't have this issue growing up. You know, we didn't, we didn't fight over her clothes because I wasn't wearing her clothes. Now, guys nowadays would have wearing our sister's clothes. I mean, <laughs> we, we got a confused generation today, but not back then. Me and my sister, you know, my, my mom, my, my, my sister never ran to the, the, into the living room and said, Mom, you know, Eddie's wearing my dress. No, you ain't going to worry about that. But if you get two females, you have that kind of issue. They're touching my stuff. They're grabbing my things. They're wearing my clothes, right? But if you look back, really, if you had the maturity to look back, it's really not your clothes. It's God's clothes. Oh, you, you're playing with my paper airplane or my model, my model card. No, it's not mine. It's his. Now, that sounds like you're really out there, you know. Listen, God gave it to us. We can have it. He, he, he don't want to play with your car. But the reality is, it's his. And once we start to understand that, we, we look at things a little bit differently, you know. And I've been always wanting our people to be that way about the church here. Listen, Pastor Eddie at the pastor of the church and his wife at the first lady, and we got a board of trustees and all that kind of stuff. But at, at the end of the day, this, this church belongs to Jesus. Amen. It's not our church. It's his church. It is, folks. I didn't say that to get, a, to get an applause. It's just the reality. It's his church. It's his. At the end of the day, it's his. And, and he's called me, he's called y'all to be good stewards of what is his. That's why, that's why if you see something that's not right, it's our job to pick it up, make it right, clean it up, do whatever it takes. Because it's not our church, it's his. we got to take ownership of the church. That's why I get so blessed when I see y'all volunteering and doing things, whether it's outside or inside. I'm like, that's people that took ownership of the church. When I first came over to be the pastor here, I got to be honest with you, I didn't have a lot of faith in people taking ownership of the church. So every time there was a function here, I was worried, what am I going to see when I get there in the morning? How destroyed is everything going to be? And you know what? I was kind of right on, on the, in, the beginning, in the earlier stages, but we have kind of matured and grown as a church, and everybody cleans up their mess when it's over with because they know that this is God's church. Let's, let's make it nice. Let's keep it clean. Let's do it right. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. I'm saying these things to, to confirm again to you that I'm not just making this up. It all belongs to him. The earth is his, and everything therein belongs to him. It's all his. And if he has given us these things to be good stewards of, you know, then we need to be good stewards of it. And it's not just our, co- our homes, our cars, our clothes, our kids. Also, it's our wallets. It's our purses. You can, I found out over the years, you can touch anything but somebody's, somebody's money. Don't mess with their money now. Oh, boy, that's when it gets tough. Remember, I've always told you, I got a different view than y'all have from up here. And I see when the offering going out, and I see that tug of war, man. You're, give me that money already, man. I see it. I see it. It's a tug of war. But I also see this. It used to be said that if you want to see where someone's heart is, look at their checkbook. Well, nowadays, nobody has a checkbook but, but me. Everybody's online. I'm, I'm still old school. So look at their online account on their computer, and you're going to see where their heart is. What I mean by that is look where people, where people are spending their money, and you can see if their heart is in heavenly things or earthly things. That's the reality. That's the reality, folks. Everything it's the Lord's. It all belongs to him. And yes, we can have a good time with it. He says, here, man, it's all mine. But since you've been a good steward of it, man, I give you a nice home. I give you a nice car. I give you a nice vacation spot. Hey, I'm going to give Pastor a brand new set of golf clubs by somebody here. I mean, whatever, you know. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you because you've been good stewards. But still, it belongs to him. You see, Philippians 4, 6-7, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why do I say that for? Because, see, when it's our money, we get all worked up about it. But when it's his, we seek him for the direction of how to spend his money. If it all belongs to God, and God is never late on a payment, by the way, He's never late on the payment, guys. God is the kind of God that does things right. So if if everything belongs to him and we're not stressed about it and we're seeking him out, we're not anxious, we're seeking him out about it through prayer and and supplication and thanksgiving, God will give us, it says here, and the peace of God which with surpassing understanding will guard our hearts. Because God will give us the peace on what to do with that resource. But when it becomes ours, 
We stay up, we stay up, up at night, you know, pacing our living room and wondering, how am I going to make this bill? How am I going to make this work out? If it's God, it always works out. I'm going to touch more about that in just a little bit. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he'll make your path straight. You know, we have got to trust in him. Amen. Not in ourselves, in him. Now, God gives us wisdom. He gives us knowledge on how to do things. But still, nonetheless, is his will that we want to seek out. So don't just lean on your own understanding. Say, God, how am I to be a good steward of what is yours? Listen. I'm going to be a little blunt here. We got, and I, won't, I never say names because I don't even know all the names, but we have very, very honest, good givers in Joy and Praise Fellowship that are faithful to giving, and then we got some that need to be shot. <laughs> and why do, I, why do I say that? Listen, listen, folks. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's not about... What tax bracket we fall into, it's about the condition of our hearts. The widow with the, that threw in the two mites, the Lord recognized. But the one that gave a lot, he didn't recognize. It's not that we don't need a lot. We need a lot. But what I'm saying is he recognizes the heart. He says she gave everything she had. It means she gave from the right heart. When I see, when I see, um, that we're growing, we're growing where we do, and, and we got more people now than we ever had before, and yet we're comparing apples to apples, comparing other churches in the area that I have friends of and pastors of, the same size church, the same size type of people, and they're, and they're out giving us by ten to $15,000 every week. You start to wonder what in the world is going on. And I asked them, do you have a lot of retirees? Oh, yeah, man, we got some that I don't even know how they do it. It's a condition of the heart. That's why we felt led to do this upcoming series because I think God's going to do some work in our hearts because the reason why so many of us are still struggling financially because we have not understood the principles of stewardship yet. And once we start being good stewards of what's his, God will start pouring into our laps some, an abundance here. But leaving God out of our financial decisions will lead to wrong choices every time. So that means everything we do, especially financially, we've got to involve the master. We've got to involve. He said, listen, I know, you know, hey... I know you put me in charge of this, but I'm, qu I'm not quite sure what to do with this. What do you think, God? And, stay, and wait around for the answer. You know, a lot of us say, well, God don't talk to me. How's God going to talk to you when you, this is your prayer life? You know, Lord, um, I got to go to work, but, um, you know, tell me, how to, tell me what you want me to do about this situation. I got to go, God. I'll talk to you later. You get in the car, you throw on the radio, and man, it's over with. There's no, he ain't talking to you. He ain't talking to you we got to be able to say, take enough time to get with God and say, God, if Pastor Eddie says you made me to be a good steward, what do you want me to do with what you put into my lap? I was talking to a friend of mine today. I won't, I won't say his name because it, I don't know if he got his wife's permission yet. But he says, I'm praying about some things, and I think the Lord might, might I'm praying about it. The Lord might want me to give a little, a little bit of a piece of land to the church. I'm praying about it. I said, okay, we'll just pray about it. See what the Lord has placed on your heart, you know. But really, it's the Lord's land that he's feeling maybe led by the Lord to, to shift it over here and give a little bit in the church's name, okay. But it's still the Lord's stuff, you see. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't belong to us. I got people say this. Like one guy said to me one day, he called the church. He said, hey, a um, um, couple months ago, I, I gave an offering there at the Lord, at, at the church. Can I get it back? <laughs> he told me that. Can I get it back? I said, no, you can't get it back. I said, once you gave it, sir, you gave it to the Lord. You didn't give it to me. I didn't spend your money. You gave it to the Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't come back. I'm sorry. That's not the way it works. So leaving God out of financial decisions leads to wrong choices. I'll give you another one here tonight. Not honoring God with the first fruit stops financial blessings. When God gave me this, I said, God, this will be the most controversial part of the message tonight. People at home looking at me right now, people in the house, there will be some of you at home, some of you here that won't agree with this thought tonight. But I'm here to tell you I love you anyway, okay? You can love and you can agree to disagree, but I'm sharing with you what I feel God laying on, to, laying on me on this topic right here. 
Not honoring God with the first fruit stops financial blessings. I'm here to tell you that, that the subject of tithing, for example, or first fruits have been a, a debatable subject in, throughout history, throughout, th- throughout decades and, and centuries, as much as, as whether a believer should drink or whether a believer should gamble or not. It's been one of them debatable things because there is no thou shalt not in there. So it's been a debatable gray issue. It hasn't been a black and white issue of the tithe. It hasn't been a black and white issue about alcoholism and that kind of stuff. But we have to always read into things, okay? There's other scriptures. It doesn't, for example, in alcohol, it doesn't say thou shalt not drink, right? It says thou shalt not get drunk. But it also says thou shalt not do anything that can cause your witness to, to, to be succumbed or cause anybody to stumble or do anything that caused you to be out of self-control. Folks, listen, I have not drank alcohol in 29 years. You let me drink one, one beer, I'm going to be pretty tipsy. I'm going to be saying more crazy things than Rebecca will be after her um, wisdom teeth come out. Okay. Anything that causes you to be out of self-control is not good for you. That's just a different subject for another day. But what I'm saying here is that the tide has been a controversial subject, and there's always been two camps. Camp number one says that was only for the Levitical priesthood. The issue of the tithe was a requirement for the Levitical priesthood, or, and, 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 and uh, furthermore, it was done away with at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross and it was finished, grace moved in, and there's no reason for the tithe anymore. That's camp number one. I, I, I respect it, but I, but I know some people are at home looking at me right now saying, that's right. I'm saying, I respect you, but I don't agree with it. The other camp said that, that, uh, the, the, other camp said that the, the tithe is biblical. There's passages in the New Testament given by Jesus and Paul himself. That, that speaks on giving. For example, don't you remember when, um, when they came to Jesus and they said, why don't your disciples um, pay taxes? And he said, well, well give, me, give me the coin. Let's see what it is. They say, Whose insignia is this? They go, well, it's Caesar. He goes, okay, give to Caesar what is Caesar, but give to God what is God's. Now, they might say right now, the other camp will say, yeah, but it doesn't give you a percentage. It doesn't give it to you. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about that in just a minute here. You see, Proverbs 3, 9 says this, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Okay. Now, again, that passage does not speak about a percentage, right? You don't see 10% in there, 5%, 20%. It just says first fruits, right? The first fruits of your crop. Now, Keep that in your mind for a minute, and also keep in your mind the fact that the Proverb 3 9 is a what? An Old Testament passage, okay? Keep that in your mind. Now, first fruits be, um, began as a faith based offering to God of first agricultural produce of one's harvest. In other words, back in the day, they weren't giving out money, they were giving produce or cattle or whatever it is. That's how they gave, okay? Uh, you know, my wife and I, we love Little House on the Prairie, and and, uh, we, and the other day I was looking at the show, and, 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 and the, doc, the doctor of the town, the people always feed it, um, the people always pay him for his services by giving him chickens. He said, I always get paid by, by chickens. I got so many chickens, I don't know what to do with all these chickens. They didn't have money. They gave chickens. That's how I went back in this day. They, they, gave, they gave the first fruits of their produce, okay? Now, in the classic Greek or Roman or Hebrew religions, the first fruits were given to the priests as an offering and then dedicated the rest unto the Lord's work, okay? That's how it was done there. Now, in the modern Christian faith where we are today, the tithe is similarly given as an offering serving to primarily to support the priests, me, and to advance the kingdom work here, at Joy and Praise Fellowship. We are a self-supportive church. It means any, any money comes in here comes through by his people, by his visitors, by his members, by his donors. Y'all give the money. And with that money, you, it, it, it take care of the, the priest, the pastor, to take care of all the ministries and the advancement of the kingdom here at the local church. And it's our job, my job, the board's job, and those that are put in that position to be good stewards of what y'all give. That's why we have, we have a, checks and a, and a, and a checks and balance here. You know, we got people that, two people that count the money. We got a board that goes over every money. We open up the books to you guys every year, and we open the books to the board every month so we know where every single thing is spent. That's why those people out there in them churches that, that are embezzled money and fraud, like back in the, in the Tammy Faye Baker and Jim Baker era, shame on them for doing that because it's not their money. And I can tell you it's a hard issue because I'm going to tell you what happened there. I read the biography about how Jim Baker and him back in the PTL days had how that happened. The way it happened was this. They called it justification. 
And they called it this way by justification. You know, when you took over this church, um, 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 you know, Pastor, um, we were only running, you know, 350, but now we're running 3,500, or now we're running 35,000, so you deserve a little bit more. And so, so do us trustees for doing such a great job. And they would give themselves all raises. Before you know it, the old concept was one for you, one for you, one for you, two for me. One for you, one for you. Before you know it, they were stealing from God's work. See, that's what gives God a bad name, the church of God a bad name. But Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 20, talks about how this kind of got started a little bit. This, this talk about a tide. And it said, after Abraham returned from defeating, uh, I think it's Kedolomer, and the kings, the kings aligned with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavir, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of, of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So now for the first time, it went from first fruits to an actual percentage, a tenth of everything he had. So now it became out a tenth, and he gave it to God Most High. Now, I want to revert back now to the New Testament where Paul says something a little bit different. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 3, Paul says this, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian church to do. On the first day of, the, of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come to, to the to collections will have been made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of instruction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. Here he uses the, 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 the phrase here, collect, I mean, putting together, setting aside a sum of money Keeping up with your income. There's a word for that we're going to talk about in a minute called proportional giving. Okay, it's a sum. He didn't say a tenth. He didn't say a percentage. He said a sum. So here in Genesis, we see an actual percentage. And here in Corinthians, Paul says a sum, okay, of money, which speaks about a proportional giving, okay? So you might say, okay, now we're at a crossroads now. What is it now, Pastor? We're at a crossroads. Well, now let's go back again to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 16, 17, where it says, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. So there you go again. There's no percentage given to it again. So, you, so that the camp over here that says that you, you should just give what you feel led to give, not a tithe, seem to be winning right now, okay? They, they're two touchdowns ahead. Everything seems to be going okay for camp number one. But you have to understand something, that that's an Old Testament passage as, long, as well as the one I'm going to tell you next, which is Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 and 11. Where God says this, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, he says. But you ask, how are we robbing you, God? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, you whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, said the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not be room enough to contain it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Here God says, you are robbing me. You might say, wait a minute, Pastor, that's an Old Testament passage. So what Deuteronomy on proportional giving? It's an Old Testament passage. But he says here, you're robbing me and you're under a curse because of it. And he does something here that you will never see in all the scripture. He said, test me on this. Remember, even Jesus, when the devil was tempting him in the wilderness, said, you don't test the Lord thy God. But here he's saying, test me on this. Test me. Test me and see if I don't open up the floodgates of heaven. He's saying, if you will be obedient to me and do this and give me what belongs to me, I will, I will bless your socks off. I'm not going to make you filthy rich, per se. You know, that's not necessarily the truth. He might, he may not. That's not what he's saying here. He said, I will take care of you. I will make your life a blessing. I will bless you to continue to be a blessing, is what he's saying here. And I like what he says here also. He says, and I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops. I remember I had a discussion with my family years ago about the tide. They go, you know all that money you're giving to the church in tithes? I said, I'm giving it to the Lord. You're giving it to the church. But anyway, the money you're giving to the church in tithes, I'm giving it to the Lord. No, you're giving it to the church. We went back and forth with this. He said, you know, you can have a brand new truck right now with that. Or you can make double car, I mean, double mortgage payment. You can have your house all paid off. I said, you know, I understand what you're saying from a practical point of view, but I also believe that God 
saves me so much money on, in a way I don't even realize it. He keeps my cars running. He keeps my appliances going. He keeps me out of all kinds of other kinds of difficulties that I don't even know he did. And now what he's talking about here, I will prevent the pest from devouring your crops. Our crops are our stuff. Our appliances. Because he's helping us guys, our wives can get their nails done. <laughs> stuff like that. He's, 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 protecting, he's protecting our stuff, our crops. And he says here, he won't let the fruit even drop before it's, before it's done. You'll keep bearing that good fruit. You see, now, now I'm here to tell you something right now that when we talk about the, the, the proportional offering, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet you halfway. I did it in the membership class, some of you remember. I'll tell you this. I know that tithing is a thing of the heart. I know it is. I know we got some of you that still drink a little bit of, of wine or whatever, and, and, and I'm, I'm not running you out here. That's still a thing of the heart. So out of respect for you, hear, hear what I'm saying to you. I'm saying that if you're in camp number one, you're saying, Pastor, it's not in my heart yet to tithe. I'm, I, I believe in that proportional offering thing. I, I can dig that. I can give a portion with my money, but I don't believe in that tithing thing yet. Okay, well, then start giving proportionally. Because, see, people are saying that, but they're not even doing that. This church, and I'm not saying all of you, but a lot of us think that the only president that came to church was George Washington. We got a stack of $1 bills this high. It's pretty bad that every time that, 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 that our treasurer and, and Jack and them are counting the money, that we have to put our hands and say, God, in the name of Jesus, turn these ones into 20s or 10s or something. We have to pray over them every single time. George Washington was not the only president to serve the Lord. On a, on a Wednesday night, it's okay to throw a few bucks in there. That, that's, that's, that's pretty understandable, but not on the main offering. Not on the main offering that you're giving to the Lord out of your abundance. So if we're going to get a proportional offering, it should be something like this. I don't, I don't have an exact number, folks. But if, if you made $500 and, and a tithe off of that is 50, right? 10% of 550. Well, a proportional offering of $500, if you believe in that, is not a dollar. How about 25? How about 30? Yo? How about even a 20? Okay, I'll give $2. No, it's not $2. I've seen, seen people put a dollar in there. It's like, can I get change? Get change? Are you kidding me? Are you riding the bus or something? What's, what do you need change for? But what's so funny about it, it sounds funny, but here's the sad thing about it, is that God wants us to prosper. He wants us to have nice things. He wants us to have an inheritance for our children. And we can't have that if we're keeping from God. So whether it be tithing or proportional giving, we have to start learning to give to God. We have to start trusting that it's not ours, that it's his in the first place. And that's why I'm talking about this tonight, and that's why we're going to have this series for four weeks. Because some of us have understood this principle for years, but some of us can't get it yet. One lady said to me the other day, I can't afford to tithe. I said, you can't afford not to. I worked a budget for it. I said, you're in such a bad shape, you can't afford not to. You need, you need, you need, forget about Charles Schwab, you need Jesus Christ to help your finances. They're that bad. Forget about Raymond James Financial, Charles Schwab. This is out of their league. You need Jesus. You need Jesus, man. But I'm here to tell you, folks, that a lot of, lot of Christians who say, I can't afford to tithe, are the same people that have three and four iPhones, three and four flat screen 70 inch TVs, have, a, have an Escalade parked out there in the parking lot, but yet they can't afford to tithe. It's all about priorities, it's all about the state of your heart. I can't speak for everybody here, but my wife and I have been blue-collar earners for the, for the majority of, of our lives and our marriage. We have always tithed, always, and God has always provided our needs. Amen. And because he, was, because he loved us, he threw a few of our wants in there. It happens. He's faithful. Trust me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lay you astray. The last passage I want to give you is found in Luke 6.38. Luke, he says here, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Amen. He said, give it. Give it to the Lord. Okay? You don't want to give a tithe? It's not in your heart yet? Give a proportional offering. But a proportional offering with keeping with your income means what God has placed on your heart. And I know, that, I know God knows our needs. And I know God knows our wants. And God is not going to lead you if you made $1,000 to throw a dollar in the offering bag. It, it just doesn't work that way. I think I told you that story a long time ago um, about that friend of mine that he invited his fiancée to church. 
at our church. And she came, and she came in with a sour attitude to begin with. And she came in, and they had worship, and she didn't participate a whole lot. And they had the word given, and she was just humbug about the word. And they came around with the offering. They get the offering at the end of that service and on the way out. And, and she, he saw she threw a dollar in there. Now, I'm not saying that some of them throw a dollar tonight because that's what usually Wednesday nights are. But they threw a dollar in there. And she got in the car, and he says, so did you like the service? She goes, no, I, I didn't really like it at all. He said, well, what do you expect for a dollar? You get out of what you put into something. Now, I'm not saying that if you give more, I'll preach better, but I sure try harder. <laughs> I'll try harder. We got to learn to not chase after materialism. Learn to be godly and content with the things God gives us. We must include God in all of our decisions. Because once he gets ownership, every decision becomes a spiritual decision. We also must honor him with the first fruits of our produce. It means when the, when the offering bag starts being passed around, we don't just say that's a good time to go to a bathroom break. Or, you know what, I forgot something in my car. Let me go out there right now. People do that. I want the usher to lock all the bathroom doors at the offering time. <laughs> all kidding aside. I'm saying all this. Hang on, brother. I'm saying all this. As your brother in Christ, because I want you to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. I want you to have a surplus. I want you to go on nice vacations. I want you to, I want you to sleep well at night. I want you never to have any delinquency in your, in your, in your, in your um, responsibilities. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed so you can be a blessing. I want you to be the lender and not the borrower. That's what God wants us to be. That's why I want so desperately for the church to be paid off. Because we're not supposed to have a loan out there. We're supposed to be the lender, not the borrower ourselves as a church. That's, that's, that's biblical. Brother, you had your hand up? They do. Yeah. We know we have online givers. Just, just, I'm glad you said that. For some of you that might say, Pastor just spoke on this Wednesday. That, that's such an put no money in the offering bag. Some people put online. They, they give online. We have people that give online and also on, on text to give. So we do have a lot of ways of getting in. This is not about putting anybody on blast. Okay, this is about a thing of the heart. This is just a reminder from your pastor to you about the condition of your heart. Make sure you give unto God what is God. Okay? Jesus, he asks us to be faithful to what belongs to him. And that's what we need to do if we're going to be good stewards of what is his stuff. So why don't we stand in God's house tonight? You've been a terrific audience as always. Tonight, Lord, I did what the cardinal sin in most people's eyes. I talked about money in church. They say you don't talk about sex, money, or politics in church. I'm a sinner, Lord. But God, I'm doing it tonight because I know you want your people to be blessed, to have an abundance, to, to advance your kingdom, God. You want your people to be the head and not the tail, God, uh, to be first and not last, to be a victor and not a victim, God. You want your people to prosper, God. For you said you came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. God, money does make life a little easier. But not only for us, but it makes it easier for your kingdom to be advanced so that souls can be won. God, you don't like a grudgingly giver. If someone is giving grudgingly, God, even if they're giving the tithe, but they're giving it in a grudgingly manner, they're not going to be blessed. I'm here tonight to say out loud that if you give your tithes grudgingly, don't give it. Keep it. It ain't going to bless you. It's not going to bless us. But if we will give from the, our heart, if in our heart, God, you are our treasure, and we give from the abundance of our heart, God, not only will we be blessed, but you'll, we'll bless the kingdom through our efforts. Be with your people tonight. Bless this upcoming four-week series. May it really speak to us. May it give us um, cur um, courage and not fear to give, to give freely to you, God, knowing that you're going to be faithful to help us in all of our situations. And for those of us, God, that you have blessed already, God, with nice homes and, and nice things, thank you for that, God. Help us to continue to be, to be faithful to you, God, you know, back, God. Help our people in our church that are doing well be a role model to us who are, who are trying to get there. And I just pray your blessings upon everybody here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.
Greet each other in the Lord as always. See you on Sunday.